kids and welcome to the screencast that is going to run you through a review of the steps of the scientific method. Uh, I have the feeling you've done this before, uh, so this is just going to be a review. First, the scientific method involves a series of steps that are used to investigate a natural occurrence. Since science is a way of knowing things, we have to make sure that what we know is based on fact. With the scientific method, we start with identifying the problem. It's usually in the form of a question. We do some observations or do some research about that problem. And then we can formulate a hypothesis, your educated guess. Then we design an experiment. From that experiment, we collect and analyze our, our data. And then we can come up with a conclusion. First of all, Let's look at the uh, problem or the question. Uh, the problem, and we're gonna, we're gonna say scientific problem from now on rather than just the question. It's always in the form of a question. Uh, but this question has to be able to be solved through experimentation. We'll discuss in class some of those problems that, uh, or questions that can't necessarily be solved at the current time scientifically. When you make observations or do research, uh, you're finding out a little bit more about this problem. Uh, some problems can't be researched in the library or online, uh, so you're stuck with making observations. Let's say, for example, animal uh, behavior uh, out in the wild. In order to understand the way that animals really work, uh, you can't take them into a laboratory and, and just make observations there. You want to watch them in their natural environment to really understand how they, how, they, uh, how they behave. But most experiments can be done in a laboratory. With this information, you can formulate a hypothesis, your educated guess. Uh, your hypothesis is typically in an if-then statement. And the way that you state it is that uh, it's, an answer to a, it's an answer to your question or your scientific problem. In your hypothesis, you, you're predicting a possible answer to the problem or the question. Here's an example. If soil temperatures rise, then plant growth will increase because, and then you would go on and give your, your reasons. The because is what you found out through your observations or your research. Then you develop an experiment. This can be the difficult part because you've got to develop the experiment uh, just right, and we'll go through the steps there. Uh, the experiment is your procedure. You've got to develop a materials list, all the things that you're going to need in order to run the experiment. And the outcome must be measurable or quantifiable. That is, you should uh, be able to um, give a quantity of data. You're going to collect and analyze your results. You want to mo modify the procedure if you need to. But once you go through the, the experiment the first time, you might identify some mistakes that were made. So before you come to a conclusion, you want to go back and sort of tweak your, your procedure and try it again. The results that you get might be interesting, but you really ought to do the experiment several times to just ensure that the data that you are getting isn't uh, left up to chance. You're going to want to organize all your data into data tables, graphs, and illustrations, or even photographs. With cell phones today, it's easy to snap a, a quick photo of uh, your experiment in process. And then you're going to come to a conclusion, of course. Include a statement that accepts or rejects the hypothesis. Now, it's very important here. Um, that uh, you don't use the word proof or proven in your conclusion. You can't prove a hypothesis or you can't uh, you can't prove a hypothesis. You can only find data that either accepts it or supports it, I say, or rejects it outright. Your conclusion is also going to make recommendations for further study and possible improvements to the procedure. As we say in science, whenever we come up with an answer, we usually create more questions that need further study. So let's put our knowledge of the scientific method to a realistic example that includes some of the terms you'll be needing to use and understand. First of all, here's a, a little story. John watches his grandmother bake bread. 
He asks his grandmother, what makes the bread rise? She explains that yeast releases a gas as it feeds on sugar. So John wonders if the amount of sugar used in the recipe will affect the size of the bread loaf. You see, what John has done is he's identified a particular question or a problem. And he does some research. He researches the areas of baking and fermentation and tries to come up with a way to test his question. Fermentation is the process that's taking place in the bread that causes it to rise. He keeps all of his information on this topic in a journal, so he's keeping notes in a sense. After talking with his teacher and conducting further research, he comes up with a hypothesis. He says, if more sugar is added, then the bread will rise higher. There's an if-then statement. Not all hypotheses have to be if-then statements, but stating them that way is good practice and it's easier to understand. So the hypothesis is an educated guess about the relationship between the independent and the dependent variables. It's very important that you understand which variable is the independent and which variable is the dependent. Here's the independent variable. The independent variable or the manipulated variable, manipulated means changed, is a factor that is intentionally varied by the experimenter. John's going to use different amounts of sugar, 25, 50, 100, 250, and 500 grams in his experiment is the amount of sugar. That's his independent variable. The dependent variable is going to be the affected outcome or the responding variable. In this case, it would be the size of the loaf of bread, what John expects to happen. His teacher helps him come up with a procedure and list of needed materials. She discusses with John how to determine the control group. If you're going to have a controlled experiment, in a scientific experiment, the control group is the group that serves as the standard of comparison. The control group may be a no treatment or an experimented or excuse me, an experimental selected group. Okay, so the control group is exposed to the same conditions as the experimental group except for the variable, variable being tested. That's the independent variable. Most experiments should have a control group. Because his grandmother always uses 50 grams of sugar in a recipe, John is going to use that amount as his control group. John's teacher reminds him to keep all other factors the same so that any observed changes in the bread can, can be attributed to the variation in the amount of sugar. By doing this, John is doing what we call a controlled experiment. Now, your scientific experiment is not a scientific experiment unless all the other variables are controlled except for the one being tested, the independent variable. We call all the other variables constants because we're going to be keeping them the same. Okay, so the con constants in an experiment are all the factors that the experimenter attempts to keep the same. Can you think of some of the constants for this experiment? Well, they might include all the other ingredients to the bread recipe. You've got to keep all of those the same in each loaf that you make. You've got to use the same oven. Ovens have different uh, calibrated temperatures. The amount of time you allow the bread to rise. The brand of the ingredients. Some may be better than others. The cooking time. You don't want to over or undercook your bread. And even the type of pan used. The size of the pan and all that. The air temperature while you're making the bread and the humidity. That could have an effect. Uh, and where the bread is left to rise even oven temperature or the age of the yeast. These are all things that could affect the outcome of your experiment. And If you don't keep them the same for every loaf of bread, you're not running a controlled experiment. So John writes out his procedure for his experiment along with all the materials uh, in his list. He has both of these checked by his teacher where she, where she checks for any safety concerns. You yourself want to think of some safety concerns so that you can, in your procedure, um, write down any precautions that an experimenter might take. See, what you're doing when you're writing out your procedure 
is you're giving instructions to someone else who might want to do this experiment. This is going to be the toughest part, I think, for some of you, because you have to think outside of your own brain. That is, if somebody else were to be reading this procedure, would they be able to do it exactly as you intended? Let's talk about trials. Trials refer to rep replicate groups that are exposed to the same conditions in an experiment. How many times are you going to do this experiment? John's going to test each sugar variable three times. And one little note here, the experimenter should attempt as many trials as reasonably possible. More trials make the data that you collect more statistically reliable. So John comes up with a data table he can use to record his data. Very important before you start the experiment, how are you going to organize the data so that you can make sense of it later. So John gets all his materials together and carries out his experiment. Here's his data. Uh, he's titled the data table, as you can see there. Very important to title it uh, with a scientific title. The size of baked bread uh, measured uh, length, width, and height. That's the volume in centimeters cubed. And he's done three different trials with uh, four different amounts of sugar. 25, 50, which is his control group. 100 grams, 250 grams, and 500 grams. He averaged the sizes of each loaf of bread in the three trials. And on the column to the right, he's got the, he's got the average volumes of the bread. As you can see, his control group was the loaf of bread that grew the largest. So John, John examines his data and notices that his control group worked the best in his experiment, but not significantly better than the 100 grams of sugar. If we go back, you can see that the 100 grams of sugar wasn't much less. Now, if he had done more trials, let's say 10 trials, 10 loaves of bread, and came up with the same data, then you might think it's significantly different. But 100 cubic centimeters really isn't, isn't that much more significantly uh, different than the control group. <clears throat> so he rejects his hypothesis that more sugar actually would make the bread rise more. But he decides to retest using sugar amounts between 50 and 100 grams because, as you could see there, there wasn't much difference. So he's thinking maybe just a little bit more than 50 grams, but less than 100 grams should work. So once again, he gathers his materials and carries out his experiment. Here are his results. He chooses, again, 50 grams as his control group and 10 gram increments up to 90. Again, on the right are the averages of the three loaves of breads from the three trials. Which one did the best? If you said the loaf of bread with 70 grams of sugar, then you'd be right. So he finds that 70 grams of sugar produces the largest loaf. His hypothesis is accepted. Again, remember he doesn't say that his hypothesis is proven right. His hypothesis is either accepted or rejected. In this case, it's accepted. So he tells his grandmother about his findings and prepares to present his project in science class. He basically writes his conclusion. We'll talk about the importance of writing the conclusion in the proper format in class. So that's it for your review of the scientific method. If you've got any questions, write them down and we'll see you back in class.